So far in this series that we have been looking at for the last seven months, we have been looking for puzzle pieces concerning God's mystery of salvation. We currently have found five pieces. We started in January finding out that the first piece was that God's plan to save mankind was not made when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, but what came from eternity. That puzzle piece was God's eternal purpose, and we found that in January. In February, we found the second piece, which was the Messiah, the one prophesied in the Old Testament, was to be known as the Son of Man. And we discussed what that means, to be the Son of Man. We looked at various Old Testament and New Testament passages that showed that this prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In March, we found the third piece, which was the Messiah was to be the Son of God. He was not just to be a man like you and me. He was to be God in the flesh. And again, we looked at Old Testament prophecy and passages in the New Testament that showed that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. Then in April and May, because this was originally a six-part series and not a seven-part series, we had looked at, I chose to break this one up into two lessons. We looked at the fact that the Messiah was to fulfill major and minor prophecies. We discussed that the major prophecies and minor prophecies are equally important, with the division being solely on my discretion, whereas the major prophecies are the ones that we remember easily. Uh, for example, the Messiah's birthplace being Bethlehem. We remember those prophecies, so I called them major prophecies. Whereas the minor prophecies were prophecies that are just as important, but ones that we tend to forget. For example, that the Messiah was to be a stumbling block for the Jews. We don't often remember that prophecy, but it is a prophecy that Jesus had to fulfill in order to be the Messiah, and we found that he fulfilled all of those prophecies. And then last month, we found the fifth piece, which is down here that the Messiah was to be the sinless sacrifice. You see, it was just not, it was not important enough, or it was not significant enough, for the Messiah to die for the sins of mankind. He had to be sinless in order for God to accept that sacrifice. Because sinful man cannot pay the price to redeem ourselves from our own sin. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy, too. But as you can see, we take a look at our puzzle, and it's missing some pieces. It's not quite complete. It is missing, perhaps, the most important piece of all. For the scriptures prophesy that the Messiah was to rise again. Now, many of you might be taken aback when I said, well, perhaps this is the most important piece of the puzzle. You might be thinking, well, I thought the crucifixion was the most important piece. And I'm not trying to downplay its importance at all. Just like I'm not trying to downplay any of those other puzzle pieces. But the crucifixion would have no significance if it wasn't for the resurrection. That's because there were many people who claimed at that time to be the Messiah. All we have to do is go to Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, verses 33 to 39, we read, When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. And that's the, the chief priests and the Pharisees who wanted to kill the apostles. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to the man outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you are about to do to these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took this advice. In this passage, Gamaliel recounted about two other men who claimed to be something or to claim to be the Messiah. 
Judas of Galilee, and Thutis. We don't know anything about these men apart from this verse. Both of these men, we find, had great followers. Both men died. But soon after, their disciples dispersed after they died. And that's because neither of these men rose from the dead. So their followers had nobody to follow after their deaths. What made Jesus different was the resurrection. The fact that Jesus was not dead. And because of that, there is a hope of the resurrection that his followers have. Because Jesus died and was raised again, we have that hope. The very fact that Jesus is followed by people today some 2,000 years almost after his death is testament to the validity of the resurrection. For what Gamaliel said was true. If Jesus wasn't from God, his followers would soon go away. But alas, Jesus was from God, and nobody could thus stop God's plans. But you don't have to take my word about the resurrection being perhaps the most important doctrine in Scripture. The doctrine that proves the crucifixion was for man's redemption of sins, and not just some guy dying on a cross. Let's take the Apostle Paul's word, a man who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Turn, if you would, now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 through 4, and then skip down to 12 through 17. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now skip down to verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as being raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise up if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ is risen. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Paul tells the Corinthians a truth that still rings true today. If Christ is still dead, there is no use being a Christian. Let's make that point again. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, there is no use being a Christian because Jesus is a fraud and we are still in our sins. However, if Jesus rose from the dead, then God was responsible for raising him up. And the rest of what was taught about and said about Jesus is true. He did die on the cross for our sins. He is our Savior. And we therefore need to obey Him. So knowing this, with the remaining time this morning, let's look at some reasons as to why we should believe in the resurrection. The first reason is that Old Testament prophecy foretold of the resurrection of the Messiah. Turn now back to the 16th Psalm. Psalm 16, we're going to read verses 8 through 11. Psalm 16, beginning verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Of course, we know that this is a psalm of David. It expresses David's joy that the Lord will not abandon him, even through all of his troubles. On its face, it doesn't sound like a prophecy of the Messiah. But as we'll see in a few moments, it very much is. Turn now to Psalms 110. Psalms 110, we're going to read verse 1. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Like Psalm 16, this too is a psalm of David. But if you were to read the entire psalm in Psalm 110, 
you would recognize some of the pieces of it from New Testament scripture that we do read very often. You will find that, but you will also recognize that the psalm was written about somebody else. It is therefore more recognizable as prophetic than Psalm 16, even though the Messiah himself isn't referenced specifically here. But again, we don't have to wonder what these two psalms are talking about. The New Testament gives us the answer, the inspired commentary, if you will. Turn now to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read Peter's entire sermon so we can get the full picture of what the, of the magnificence of this prophecy as Peter applied it to Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, we're going to start reading at verse 14. But let's remember, the Holy Spirit has fallen on the apostles. They begin speaking in tongues and are accused of being drunk. And that's where we'll pick up at verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted, his, lift, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirits, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Here we get back to the Psalms. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set up one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. What a powerful message. Peter here talked about how David had prophesied that the Messiah's body was not going to decay in this earth because his soul would be reunited with that body and he would not be left in Hades, the place of the dead. He would be raised. He talked about how David was a prophet when he spoke these words as he was when he wrote the words of Psalms 110 which said, the Lord said to my Lord. That's that's an easy phrase for us to utter, but it's very profound in what it says. By using this phrase, it was obvious that David wasn't talking about himself. Because David wasn't ascended into the heavens. He was buried, and the people knew where his tomb was in that day. No, David was a king on this earth. He was a lord, but David had a lord, 
God the Father, and he spoke of another Lord that David had. Peter said that other Lord was Jesus, the man whom they crucified not 50 days earlier. God had made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. This was the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. It was the message that people obeyed that day. And it is the message that has resonated for almost 2,000 years since. I believe in the resurrection because it was prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But that's not the only reason I believe in the resurrection. Another reason is because Jesus gave us a sign of his resurrection. One that had to be true if he was to be the Messiah. And of course, is the sign of the prophet Jonah. The sign was given in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 40, we read, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now before we get to the sign itself, the very fact that Jesus referenced Jonah at all shows that he believes that the events of that book are actual fact. Many people view Jonah being swallowed by a great fish and surviving to be an interesting story, a story that we could tell our children, but they categorize it as a myth, much like the myths of Zeus and Hercules. This is not how Jesus referenced it. He viewed it as fact so much so that he used this story as a sign. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so Jesus would be dead for three days and three nights. Now it must be noted that Jesus was using the figure of speech here. He was not saying that he would be dead literally 72 hours and not 72 hours in one minute or one second. That's not what he was saying. And this is really what trips up many people in believing the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that Jesus was only dead part of three days and really only two nights when you think about it. The reason, reason for this confusion is because they were misunderstanding what Jesus was saying. Was Jonah literally in the belly of the fish for 72 hours? Read Jonah 1 and it's easy to see that that phrase, three days and three nights, isn't a measure of exact time, but a figure of speech meaning parts of three days. Jesus died on Friday. We know this from reading John 19, verses 30 and 31. There we find when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The Sabbath, we know, was Saturday. The day of preparation was Friday. So Jesus died on Friday. Jesus was buried before the Sabbath because you Jews wouldn't bury people on the Sabbath. That would be work. Jesus was buried before sundown on the day of preparation. He remained dead throughout the Sabbath on the entire day. We know that from reading Matthew chapter 27. You can turn there. And we're going to read verses 57 through 66. Matthew 27, verses 57 through 66. When it was Eve, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead. The last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. 
So here we have on the Sabbath, the Pharisees, they understood what Jesus meant about being dead for three days. They asked a guard to be placed at the tomb to prevent the disciples from stealing Jesus' body and proclaiming that he was raised. And of course, Pilate allowed this and it was done. Now we come to the first day of the week, the day we call Sunday. Today is the first day of the week. This was the day of the resurrection. We know that from Matthew 28. Let's continue. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, and said, Come, see the place where the body lay. So let's put this all together. Jesus died and was buried on Friday. He was in the grave all day Saturday and arose early on Sunday. Whether you reckon time by Jewish or Roman standards, that's part of three days and would fit the figurative phrase three days and three nights. And when the chief priests had heard what had happened, they didn't argue that Jesus hadn't been dead long enough, for that would have been a powerful argument. No, they knew exactly what that meant. But in order to spread doubt, they paid the soldiers to tell the people that the body was stolen by the disciples. Let's read Matthew 28, verses 11 through 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while you were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews until this day. The attitude of the chief priest never ceases to amaze me. Jesus taught among them for three years, performed many indisputable miracles, yet their hatred of him caused them to want him dead. After getting their wish, all they needed to do was make sure that they could produce a body four days later and they could prove Jesus was a fraud. Alas, he rose again. They couldn't produce that body. They knew that his disciples, nor anyone else, had stolen that body. But instead of admitting this and obeying Christ, they decided to spread a lie about Jesus' body being stolen. This lie was so ludicrous because Jesus wasn't the only one raised that day. We forget that in the entire story. Many others were raised as well. Imagine coming home and finding your father, your mother, your brother, or your sister who had died years before sitting at your kitchen table. Now, both my parents are alive, but if they weren't and I saw them raised from the dead, it would certainly cause me to believe that I needed to turn to some higher power. At least I needed to investigate. If I lived at that time, it would also cause me 50 days later to believe in Jesus, the one whom God raised up to be my savior. But that wasn't the chief priests. They hated, their hatred of Jesus blinded them and hardened their hearts to the truth. God won't accept us with hardened hearts. We must be willing to submit and allow him in. And that requires humility and repentance. So the resurrection followed the sign of Jonah just as Jesus said it for them. And that's another reason I believe in the resurrection. But perhaps the most compelling reason that I believe in the resurrection is because many witnesses saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. That's Paul's argument to those who doubted in Corinth. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll reread starting at verse 3, but we'll go down to verse 8. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, 
though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. As is true with any life event, the more witnesses you have, the more believable the story is, especially if that story is amazing. Not only that, the more independent witnesses you have. By this, I mean the separate appearances of Jesus, where he didn't appear to large crowds all at once, where a, uh, a story of mass hallucinations won't stick if he appeared to many different people at many different times. The more independent witnesses you have, the more believable the story is. Jesus wasn't just seen by the apostles who then reported it to the people. He was seen of the women in Matthew 28, verses 9 and 10. He was seen by the men on the road to Emmaus in Luke, 20, uh, Luke 24, verses 13 and 34. And he was seen of almost 500 people at once, something that we don't have recorded in scriptures apart from 1 Corinthians 15. And as we said before, others were raised on that day as well. There were many witnesses. If we were to take this type of evidence to a court today about an event that happened in our lifetime, the jury would certainly find this believable due to the high number of credible witnesses. Therefore, based on the preponderance of the evidence, that means the collection of all the evidence, we can have confidence that Jesus rose from the dead, and since he rose from the dead, all the scriptures concerning Jesus are true. He is our Savior, and we can have a hope of heaven if we obey Him. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man came, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Because Jesus died and rose again, I can have faith that when and if I die, assuming Jesus doesn't come first, I will rise again from the dead. This is the hope of a Christian, a hope that will keep us going even in times of difficulty. So let's quickly sum this up. The Messiah was prophesied to rise from the dead. The scriptures teach us that Jesus rose from the dead. He is therefore the Messiah. Now let's move back to our puzzle. We have found now the, la the second to the last piece of our puzzle on the mystery of salvation. It is the second to the last piece because we still have this big hole in the middle. We've created all six pieces, and lo and behold, we still have a missing piece. So what is the mystery of salvation? That piece that brings all the other pieces together. Well, it's been staring us in the face all along. It has been in every title of this series. It's Jesus. And more specifically, salvation of the entire world through Jesus. That's the mystery of salvation. Now let's return to where we started in January. Turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to read the whole chapter. We read part of the chapter in January, and I skipped the rest because that's the basis for the rest of the series. Let's read Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, prisoner for Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have re written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to these holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ 
and to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We can understand the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how both Jews and Gentiles can be saved by reading the scriptures and believing in God. John said in John 20, verses 30 to 31, there was a reason he wrote his gospel. In John 20, verse 30, we read, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Our faith is not based on wishful thinking or pie in the sky, but on the hope and the, on the evidence of things we have not seen. I am reminded of what Jesus told Thomas in John 20, verses 27 to 29, those three other verses right before what we just read. There we read, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. The question I have for everyone in the audience this morning is, What will you do? with the evidence that we've presented. Will you believe it and be saved? Or will you reject it and be condemned? The choice is yours and yours alone. I strongly urge those who have not obeyed Christ to do so even today. For as we said earlier, we do not know what tomorrow brings.